All right, so we are a little past 7 p.m. So I think we will uh, go ahead and get started. Um, so as I said, um, we are very thankful tonight to welcome Dr. Adamson Forty, And I think you are all going to learn so much uh, from his presentation um, on a topic that can influence athletes um, of all pursuits and all ages. Um, Dr. Tenforti is an associate professor in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at Harvard Medical School. He is a sports medicine physician at Spalding Rehabilitation, a member of the Mass General Brigham Healthcare System. Dr. Tenforti is the director of Shockwave Medicine and medical director of the Spalding National Running Center, one of the only centers in the United States exclusively dedicated to the diagnosis and treatment of running related injuries. Dr. Senforti has the unique perspective of being both a doctor and former professional runner who is an All-American at Stanford University where he contributed to three NCAA national team championships and later qualified for the Olympic trials in both the 5,000 and 10,000 meter events. He completed medical school, PMNR residency and sports fellowship training at Stanford University Medical Center prior to joining the faculty at Spalding Rehabilitation. Dr. Tenforti's research has focused on understanding modifiable risk factors for stress fractures, tendinopathy, and other running injuries and interventions to address these injuries, including use of extracorporeal shockwave. He has received multiple grants to support his research, and his work has resulted in over 120 publications and 100 research abstracts. His expertise has been recognized, including serving as co-chair to develop the first youth running consensus statement selection to the Collaborative Research Network Youth Sports Spe Specialization Group for American Medical Society for Sports Medicine and content expert for the International Olympic Committee Relative Energy Deficiency in Sports Update Consensus Statement in 2018. So um, we're going to turn it over to our speaker now. And again, I think you are all going to learn so much uh, that will help you enjoy your sport as healthfully as possible. Well, thank you for the kind uh, introduction, Amanda, and uh, really grateful to present to this group. You'll have to pardon me. I am sure as, as, other, uh, as others are experiencing, there's pretty significant allergies right now. So um, that's all that is. All right, so my talk is on the advances of management and prevention of running injuries. And I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. So first, I'm going to start with defining some of the common forms of running related injury we're familiar with in runners. Uh, using that, we're going to then identify risk factors for each uh, type of injury that can help to guide optimal management and strategies to um, help treat these more uh, challenging cases. And then I'm, I'm gonna dovetail the conversation into what, what do we understand about youth runners? Um, because I think this is a really exciting area where, because we love our sport and we want the next generations to be able to enjoy it. It's really nice to be empowered with information on advising young runners and keeping people in the sport throughout the lifetime. So, uh, again, you know, as, as was introduced in my bio, I come from the perspective of someone who's run at a high level, um, honestly not the fastest uh, runner uh, in my household, though my, that, that title goes to my wife, uh, Kate, uh, maiden name was O'Neill. She uh, was a 10,000 meter uh, specialist at the 2004 Olympics. Uh, but, you know, we, we both come in with our perspectives from the sport and we just want to see uh, individuals get to enjoy the sport throughout their throughout their lives. Um, I'm also part of the Spalding National Running Center, you know, as as was outlined, we're one of the few places in the United States that really focuses on exclusively treating uh, and trying to prevent running related injuries. So it's a it's a really exciting uh, group to be part of and and really enjoy taking care of the injured runners. Um, hopefully you don't need to see me, but if you do, I'm, I'm, I'm a nice person and I, I will do whatever I can to help you get back to uh, enjoying the sport. So to start, we understand these running injuries are extremely common. They um, have been estimated to um, have up to 80% uh, uh, annual incidence and about half are thought to recur. 
Um, these injuries, we can kind of classify them into injuries to tendon, joint, and bone. And using those classifications, we can start to talk about what we understand to be risk factors and ways to optimally treat these injuries. We have to recognize these injuries are extremely common. This was some work looking at running related musculoskeletal injuries. And you see the, the concept of shin splints or medial tibial stress syndrome is one of the most common in annual incidents, followed by other injuries we're all familiar with, Achilles tendinopathy, plantar fasciitis, uh, tendinopathy, ankle injuries, IT band syndrome, hamstring injuries, uh, stress fractures, and uh, the condition patellofemoral pain. So we're going to kind of go into these classes of injury, and I'll, I'll talk about, you know, more specific injuries, but then try to do what I can to generalize how this may apply across these classes of injuries. And that helps us then to understand the risk factors that we can try to identify that can help with optimally treating these injuries. So first to start with bone stress injury, this represents a failure of the skeleton to withstand submaximal forces acting over time. So this is really an overuse injury to bone versus a traumatic, you know, excessive force to the bone that causes the bone to fail after one uh, extreme load. Um, I was very fortunate to be the, the co-senior author on a Nature Reviews a Disease Primers on, on this topic. And essentially, this schematic helps us to understand what happens with a bone stress injury. So uh, there's a, a red feedback loop, which represents a maladaptive response, where the forces that act on bone can result in a stress or strain. This results in micro damage to the bone. And that micro damage has to be repaired with what we call targeted remodeling. So that's essentially going to be an increase in activation, which is going to make the bone weaker before it can become stronger. And if this results in further damage, it has a feedback cycle, which can progress on to development of a bone stress injury, or in the more extreme cases, a stress fracture. In contrast, if an individual has loads that are adaptive in response, it either results in no damage or it results in repair of those micro damage in a way that allows the bone to be stronger and to be more resistant to those forces. So we have to really kind of think about what happens with a bone stress injury. It's basically the bone can't keep up with the demands that we put on it. And that's why we see it a lot of times in long distance running because it is a repetitive load to the bone. We actually believe that bone stress injuries may account for up to 20% of the injuries that come into sports medicine clinics. And again, I think that depends on, on who you see. I see a lot of bone stress injuries just as this is one of my expertise, but these are not actually that uncommon. Uh, we know these happen at young ages. In fact, in a population of nine to 15 year olds, the Growing Up Today study, which is based out of Nurses Health uh, Framingham study, demonstrated almost 4% of girls uh, sustained uh, stress fractures. And these were in fact, uh, quite common in runners. And there has been other studies at the high school level suggesting that female and male cross country runners are two of the top three uh, rates for stress fractures by athletic participation. We've even seen in our Stanford and UCLA uh, populations up to a 20% annual incidence and those injuries, especially when you get to the higher level or when you're preparing for an event, we, we all know how that can be very uh, disruptive to being able to, you know, have all that training pay off with being able to perform well on that race day. We also believe that youth may be a risk factor. So in the military uh, in Israel, everyone is required to participate. And they found that every year older than military recruits were when they started their basic training, they were actually at a 28% reduction in risk for stress fractures. So this actually you know, makes the argument that we need to give bones enough time to reach their peak strength, which really happens in the early third decade of life. And there's other evidence within uh, high school or uh, youth runners that early sports specialization, so really focusing primarily on the sports of cross country and track and field running may actually be associated with a higher risk for injury. So um, I'll present later slides that really kind of show what we understand about these injuries in young runners. And it, it leads me to say that I love our sport. And I think that 
we should be able to enjoy it our whole lifetime, but we do have to be thoughtful on how enthusiastic we are based on uh, the life stages for an individual to ensure that we can do it safely and, and reach our peak growth, especially at younger ages. So um, this was actually a study um, in middle school runners that we uh, were able to complete and we're really grateful to uh, the support from, um, from some of the coaches and runners who, who uh, encouraged others to complete this. This was actually a population of over 2,100 middle school age runners. And we found that even at age uh, 13, uh, almost 5% had a history of bone stress injury by average age of 13, which is quite surprising. Uh, it appeared to be higher in girls than boys at 6.7 versus 3.8%. And not surprisingly, the tibia, the metatarsal bones and the fibula were the three most common locations for injury in these young athletes, which really mirrors what we typically see in, in older track and field athletes. Now, when we think about risk for bone stress injury, it's not just because we're runners that we get these injuries, there's other, aspects of overall physical activity and biological factors that may influence bone health. We also have to uh, have to acknowledge that there's a component that may, you know, at this stage is not my modifiable, which is genetics, which is estimated to account for up to, you know, 85 to 90% of peak bone mass. We also need to uh, account for the fact that um, men and women may have different risk factors. Um, and so understanding those risk factors becomes important to really optimize the management in a female versus a male runner. Uh, one component that's really important to understand is this concept of the female and male athlete triad, um, which is really described as energy, energy availability. So that's the energy you take in minus the energy you expend when you exercise. Um, that influences menstrual function, or in males, it affects uh, testosterone status. And both the, the hormonal milieu and the nutritional status uh, impact bone health. And so an athlete that isn't getting enough nutrition to meet the demands of sport, in females that can present as what on the extreme of functional hypothalamic amenorrhea. So that's essentially something from the, the brain and the pituitary uh, axis, which actually shuts down uh, menstruation due to the low energy availability state. And without the cyclic uh, estradiol and progesterone in female athletes, that places them at risk for having very weak bones and in, in the extreme that can be osteoporosis. Uh, similarly in males that have, you know, what we would call the hypogonadal state. So low testosterone with actual symptoms such as erectile dysfunction, uh, those athletes from low energy availability can also have um, osteoporosis. And we recognize that this exists on a spectrum. So not all athletes who um, are uh, insufficient in their caloric intake are gonna develop uh, true amenorrhea. They may just have periods that become lighter or further apart during harder training. They may have bone mineral density measures that are lower, but don't meet the criteria for a more extreme state of osteoporosis. And so we think of this as a spectrum, and that's why it's important to understand when an athlete starts to see disruptions. Uh, and in female athletes, that oftentimes is irregulation and menstrual periods uh, when, when not on some type of hormonal treatment or a condition such as pregnancy that would be known to affect menstrual status. We really need to at least be thinking about the nutritional status in, in considering why this may be happening and address that. The concept on the right is the newer, um, is the newer way of defining low energy availability and that is the term relative energy deficiency in sports. So I was really fortunate to be selected by the, um, the International Olympic Committee to be part of this expert group. And essentially what the, the Red S state um, incorporates is this concept of the female and male athlete triad, but it also describes how Athletes who have a low energy availability state may have impaired immune function. They may have issues with constipation or diarrhea, things they just have, you know, been chalked up to maybe, you know, runner's gut. Uh, from a cardiovascular standpoint, we know that 
uh, women that are in a low estradiol state, I mean, that essentially describes what happens around the time of menopause when women start to be at higher risk for cardiovascular disease. They start to resemble men over time um, because estradiol is protective. There can be effects on psychology in younger athletes, effects on growth and development. Um, unexplained anemia or low white count can also be seen with this low energy availability state. These athletes oftentimes report their metabolism seems to be suppressed, and that's due to the fact that their body is essentially downregulating a normal metabolism, and that can have other effects on the endocrine system. This schematic is another way of understanding the low energy availability state. And again, we really believe this happens at the level of the brain and hypothalamus. So with low energy availability, this down regulates activity at the brain and hypothalamus level. This manifests as a reduction in sex hormones. So in females, that's menstrual dysfunction and a reduction in bone mass. In males, that's low testosterone. It can also lead to a reduction in growth hormone sensitivity. So um, this essentially results in the body being more in a catabolic state where individuals are losing muscle and bone mass. It can result in suppression of thyroid hormones. So sometimes these athletes will see a doctor and be told they have some kind of subclinical hypothyroidism. Um, and, you know, there's certainly some controversy in our sport around that. But essentially, we believe that most of these athletes don't, in fact, have true thyroid disease. What they're dealing with is suppressed metabolism because their energy state is not being met. This can also lead to um, an elevation in cortisol. And cortisol is, is quite catabolic, so it leads to muscle and bone ma mass loss and also can contribute to menstrual dysfunction. So again, when the gun goes off, you, you want a, a little jolt of cortisol to allow you to react and to you know, be ready uh, to, to you know, respond to uh, the stress of, of sport. But if you're chronically in a stressed state, that obviously is not gonna be good for your long-term health and it really plays out in this model. In contrast, those athletes who meet adequate energy availability, um, they don't develop this athletic amenorrhea. They, in fact, are able to maintain normal menstrual periods. Their bone mass is, responds favorably to the sport and, is, and their bones remain strong. Growth hormone sensitivity allows for building lean and bone mass. Thyroid hormones should be in a normal uh, balanced state or euthyroid. And that allows for normal metabolism. And then, of course, you know, cortisol is 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 a response to an acute stress, and uh, this allows for a more normal response to that hormone over time. We found that these female athlete tried risk factors do seem to be associated with the risk for bone stress injuries. So, some work by one of my uh, friends and colleagues, Michelle Barrick, demonstrated a BMI of less than 21 appears to be a risk factor for um, stress fracture. We found uh, less than 19 in high school uh, female runners. Elevated dietary restraints, so again, uh, eating behaviors, uh, which are probably linked to low energy availability, have been shown to be a risk factor. Late menarche. So again, this is a really important thing. Every young woman should reach her first menstrual period before age 15, almost without exception. And this is in fact a risk factor for developing a bone injury, not just around the time of menarche, but even uh, later in life. History of fracture has also been shown to be arguably one of the strongest risk factors for a bone injury. Lower bone mineral density. So those are values from DEXA is a risk factor. And these risk factors appear to be cumulative. So um, this is why the menstrual history for female athletes is so important. Even if a, a woman's in her 20s or 30s, what happens during high school can sometimes influence risk for impaired bone health and risk for injury. And it's also why we should be focused on that during childhood and adolescence to make sure these young women are being given appropriate um, information on looking at their uh, nutrition state and other ways to address this uh, from a non-hormonal standpoint. So we've also looked at these uh, similar risk factors in male athletes. So this is this was some of the earlier work I did with one of my friends and collaborators, um, Emily Krauss at Stanford and UCLA. 
And, and a lot of this was the basis for developing the male athlete tried consensus paper. So we were able to identify, uh, we were able to follow 156 male runners over 307 years of observation uh, at Stanford and UCLA. And we found that actually 27% of all male runners sustained one or more bone injury. And each of these, um, each of these risk uh, category points was associated with a higher risk for bone injury. I'll go into what these risk uh, factor points look like. So in the female athlete, this is, um, this is available for the female athlete tried coalition consensus statement. It's something that I recommend medical providers um, incorporate into their pre-participation exam for runners. So it includes um, six six elements. The first is energy availability. So the second is BMI. The third is a late menarche. Uh, the fourth is any history of oligomenorrhea or amenorrhea. So that's disruption to normal menstrual periods. The fifth is bone mineral density, which we get from a DEXA scan. And then the sixth is stress reaction or stress fracture. Each of these categories can either be scored as there's no risk, the athlete has normal menstruation and an age that was low enough, no history of dietary restriction, their BMI is above 18 and a half, their bone density, if it's known, is in the normal range, they've never had a bone injury. Those athletes don't get any risk uh, points. But what you do see is that in the low energy availability state, uh, you know, a prior history of disordered eating gets one point or someone who currently meets criteria for having a diagnosed eating disorder gets two. A BMI between 17 and a half and 18 and a half is actually considered um, a moderate risk that so gets a point. And 17.5 has been a cutoff defined as high risk. In female athletes, uh, reaching menarche between 15 and 16 years of age is one point or 16 and older is two. Again, this history of six to nine menstrual periods at any time after achieving menarche over 12 months, that actually gets a point. And fewer than six menstrual periods at any stage after menarche uh, over 12 months, that actually is considered high risk, that's two points. Then there are the measurements for bone mineral density. Again, we use Z scores versus T scores. So I sometimes have athletes come in and they tell me they have osteopenia. I'm not really sure what that is. If you're if you're a younger female or male athlete, that's not really a term we use. We use lower bone mineral density and space on Z-scores. And then prior stress reaction, stress fracture is also graded. Uh, in male athletes, obviously, um, we don't have the menstrual variables, uh, but in, there probably will be proxies for testosterone status that may be developed at some stage. But if we take out those variables, each of these risk factor points for females um, is actually pretty strongly predictive for risk for a future bone injury in male athletes, as I showed on the prior slide. Um, so in addition to the energy uh, availability, we also talk about the role of calcium and vitamin D. And this was a really uh, important study that was done in the Navy military, which showed that uh, supplementing with 2000 milligrams of calcium and 800 international units of vitamin D reduced the risk of stress fractures during an eight week basic military training by 20%. So maybe there is a role for supplementation, particularly for female athletes. What we've learned though, from looking at other studies, and this is, um, this is some work by Jerry Knives and one of my collaborators, Kristen Ciani, who did um, a wonderful two year observational uh, or randomized control trial on oral contraceptive pills in female athletes and seeing if that reduces stress fracture. She was able to look at uh, the baseline uh, dietary intake of calcium and vitamin D and actually found that those female runners who consume less than 800 milligrams of calcium per day had a six fold increased risk for a stress fracture compared to those that consume more than 1500 milligrams. She also looked at specific elements of the diet and actually found that every cup of milk consumed reduced the risk of a stress fracture by 62%. And again, I, I, I love to highlight this finding because, you know, something as simple as drinking a glass of milk, you know, this, these results would be more power. This would be like a blockbuster medication, a multi-billion dollar medication, right? Everyone would want to take it because if you could reduce the stress fracture risk by 62%, you know, you'd say, hey, I'm... I'm game, you know, I'm doing a sport that puts me at risk. Well, 
again, this comes down to the fact that uh, milk not only contains calcium, it's oftentimes fortified with vitamin D. It's a source of uh, calories. It gives you protein, phosphorus, a lot of the building blocks that we need for bone. And this really is, is what I ad advise runners is uh, calcium intake from food is the most important. Uh, vitamin D supplementation is, is really where I look at supplement or for iron. But for the most part, if you can get your meals with whole foods and avoid all of the processed um, kind of nutraceutical industry, you're, you're more likely to have a, a much more balanced diet and optimize your, your bone and musculoskeletal health. Um, so we've also need to think not only about the calcium, vitamin D status and energy availability, but we also need to think about sleep. And I mean, I can, I can speak as, as having been a runner at a D1 level, you know, we're not perfect with our sleep. And I think as, as runners, you know, throughout life, a lot of us are type A, we're, we're working, you know, we're working hard, we're running hard, we're, we're trying to get it, we're trying to make um, use of every hour of the day. Uh, so sometimes sleep gets uh, sacrificed. This study, uh, to me, really highlights why sleep is particularly important when you're training for an event. Uh, this was a study in male military recruits where they were um, apparently, you know, consented to do the study. I wouldn't sign up for it. You were either assigned to be sleep deprived for 62 hours, uh, be asked to sleep uh, standing upright for six hours a night, or allowed to sleep horizontally. And they measured changes in bone mass, uh, urinary calcium levels, um, and other measures of bone turnover over a week. What was amazing from this study is that there was a there was a, a large fraction of those that were in the sleep deprived or vertical sleeper uh, state who were basically rapidly losing bone mass. In fact, uh, they had a reduction of 5% of their bone density over seven days. And so that would be the equivalent on a DEXA scan of having your bone density go down a full point, um, which would put you at an elevated risk for injury. But if we think about more than anything, what this might mean for a runner, particularly when you're at a high volume of training, you know, those extra workouts, that extra long run during a time in which your body may not be repairing bone and may in fact be at a state of just trying to maintain a balanced bone bone deposition to bone loss, this is really not the time to push the envelope because we may pay for it with risk for bone injury. We can also think about the biomechanics and how that influences bone injury. So um, a, lot of, a lot of the work on bone stress injuries uh, comes from um, my, uh, my former collaborator, Irene Davis. Uh, she was able to demonstrate that landing harder is associated with um, certain bone stress injuries, particularly of the tibia. There's been other work demonstrating um, a higher free moment or a longer stride length. And again, a if you're overstriding, you may also be striking the ground harder. These are, are risk factors for bone stress injury. From the way that we land, uh, this is not an uncommon pattern we see in runners. The runner who has a little uh, chafing between their knees or they, they seem to be kicking their shins and they got little like dirt patches on their inside of their shin. Uh, this, this would be uh, an example of someone who's running where they have increased uh, rear foot eversion, oftentimes kind of seen as in someone who may be excessively pronates. And those with greater uh, peak hip adduction, so their thighs come inwards and are, uh, the knees are going to touch together. Those are risk factors for uh, tibial stress fracture. So now that we kind of know what some of those risk factors are, we can use those to help guide our management. So first off, all injuries, we really should be focused on ensuring the athlete has optimal um, nutrition intake. So not only their energy availability, but also looking at their calcium intake. And I'll recommend at least 1200 milligrams a day, unless they're in high school. And during that time, 1300 milligrams a day is considered the standard, uh, you know, a recommended daily allowance. So we may even target higher, closer to 1500. A vitamin D supplementation of 1000 international units per day, at minimum would be recommended. Um, I really don't 
recommend using any medications for pain. Uh, pain is actually the most important thing for us to watch when we manage an athlete with a bone injury, because if you're having pain, that means your bone is taking on load that's keeping it uh, from healing. Um, and in particular, we avoid anti-inflammatories. So uh, medications like Aleve, ibuprofen, uh, naproxen, these are all medications that act on inflammation. And inflammation has actually been shown to be part of how bone heals. And in the military, it's actually been shown that taking an anti-inflammatory medication, again, things like ibuprofen, Aleve, naproxen, um, those actually put you at a higher risk for sustaining a bone stress injury. We also need to ensure in the early stages that we modify activities. So in some cases, that includes the use of boot and crutches to completely offload the bone really want athletes to focus on good sleep. I've had athletes come in, they got bags under their eyes. They're like four weeks from diagnosis of an injury. And I'm like, dude, what's going on here? And they'll, you know, they'll say, well, you know, I have to get up a couple hours earlier. I got to get to the pool. I got to get to the gym. I got to keep my fitness going. And sometimes, you know, I will actually just say, look, I'm going to prescribe rest. You just need to sleep. You need to, you need to get your body in a state where it's, it's going to be, aggressively working to repair your bone injury because again you're you're kind of borrowing that energy that you need to heal if you're not getting the sleep you need um and then we really need to think about a better workup for uh someone's bone uh, quality so i will get dexas in a lot of cases um i will do a medical workup to make sure that we're not missing things like a low iron status with anemia that their vitamin d status is optimized and that we're not missing other you know and true endocrine uh, diseases that could be affecting uh bone health PT is a must. I, I don't think that just because you've been in a boot for six weeks that your, your bone injury is healed. Uh, there's probably a way that you were moving in the past that contributed to that injury that could benefit from a movement specialist. That's what physical therapists do. And in particular, if you've been offloaded, you may be uh, weaker on that side and you may actually be stiffer after wearing a boot. So a physical therapist who really looks to restore your range of motion and strength and help to normalize things before you get back into running is going to be really important, not only to treat the current injury, but to, pre uh, to prevent future. And then we do have other medications and um, a treatment that I do in my clinic called Shockwave that can be considered for more severe or um, challenging cases. So um, with with understanding these bone injuries, there are grading scales. Um, there are some doctors that are very hesitant to do more than an x-ray to ensure that an athlete doesn't have a fracture. But um, MRI has really been shown to be the gold standard for diagnosing and understanding the severity of injuries. So unless there's a huge you know, financial constraint um, or you know, insurance isn't going to pay for it, um, especially if it's in a high risk location, I will recommend an MRI, even if an x-ray is normal. And that helps us to understand, is there in fact a bone injury? Is there, you know, secondary soft tissue injury that might also be contributing to pain? And the severe, the, the grading scale on MRI can also help to predict um, appropriate return to play. I mean, if you're six months out from a marathon and discover it's a very low grade injury that takes six to eight weeks, chances are you're going to be able to train. Uh, and, and prepare for that marathon. But if you find that it's a stress fracture, that may actually take, you know, upwards of three to four months and, and you may reconsider whether that's a, that, that race is still your primary goal. So that gets into the grading scale and some of the work I've, I've done with collaborators in Germany. And we actually were able to pull these prior MRI findings and show that Yes, well, there is some controversy on the relative role of MRI or whether MRI can help us understand where that injury is on the spectrum of, of severity. The severity of the injury does, in fact, seem to play out with the MRI in predicting when someone can return to sport. So again, for a grade one injury that's very early bone edema, um, that may take you know six to eight weeks to fully return to sport. Uh, a grade two injury is a little bit more extensive bone edema, but not seeing uh, drop out a signal on the other, the other uh, MRI images, the T1 images. Those can take 10 weeks. 
And then when you get into grade three and then grade four is stress fracture, those injuries can take, you know, anywhere from 12 to 20 weeks really to get back to full return to sport. And injuries that occur um, in, in different bones actually heal at different rates. So we'll get into this a little bit more later, but an injury in the tibia may actually take less time to heal than the same great injury in the sacrum or the femoral neck. And that's because of differences in the bone biology that may actually make it take longer for the bone to heal. So we also have to think about the athlete who comes in, seems to follow the grading scale and then gets an injury within six months. I mean, what a frustrating uh, situation. And I've, I've seen it in, in a number of athletes. Um, and now I finally have a study that helps us understand why this may happen. Um, so I was very lucky to be part of a study where we um, recruited uh, female athletes that had at least a grade two bone injury. And then we would get these specialized uh, CT sequences that helped us to understand bone strength. We would get them within two weeks of the diagnosis, and then we would get them at six, uh, six weeks, uh, three months, six months, and one year. What was really surprising to our group was that the bone strength that we measured within two weeks of the injury, so before the bone really had time to weaken from out load, that baseline value was only reached by six months on average. And there was actually the lowest measurements that we had in our study were at 12 weeks. So right around the time when a lot of these athletes are returning to sport, it may have been really offloaded where their bones may be particularly weak. This may be the very time where they're starting to get back into running. And if they run, if they run or are too aggressive with their total amounts of loading, jumping, uh, total activity on their feet, uh, maybe at, at a greater risk for the bone not having reached its normal strength and actually then getting a secondary injury. And the other really interesting thing about the schematic is the, the red and the blue. The red is the injured leg, but note that the blue, the uninjured leg, sees a very similar trend. So it's not just that we're offloading the leg that's injured, but it's actually the full skeleton is responding to the fact that we're not doing the regular running. And in fact, then you're seeing this global loss of bone strength in the lower extremities. So this leads me to sometimes have a more nuanced approach with an athlete that's had this type of unfortunate recurrent injuries within you know, a six to 12 month time frame to point to this and say, look, it's really frustrating, but there is a good explanation. And I'm very hopeful that we can use this information to come up with a better customized plan to ultimately get you back to running. So these high risk location injuries, these are ones where I really, I want runners to see someone like me or someone who has like more advanced knowledge of bone injury. So injuries that occur in the femoral neck, uh, in the navicular bone, in the front of the shin, so that's the anterior tibia, uh, the medial malleolus, which is that inside ankle bone, uh, the talus, which is part of the ankle joint, uh, injuries at the base of the second metatarsal, uh, right at the right in uh, an area called Jones fracture, the fifth metatarsal. These are injuries that typically require four to six weeks of non weight bearing, so on crutches, and uh, in the case of the foot injuries, oftentimes in a boot to allow the bone to appropriately heal. We also need to think during this entire time of healing, we really want this athlete in uh, optimal energy availability because we want women to have those normal menstrual functions. We want men to have testosterone that gets converted to estradiol that allows for bone gains. We have to recognize that it can be very frustrating for, uh, this is a schematic for the Female Athlete Triad Coalition describing that even if a female athlete immediately buys into the plan is really increasing their energy status, the menstrual status for an athlete that was in low energy availability, it may take up to a year on average to get back to normal. So it's, you know, continued, you know, encouragement for that female athlete that's, that's making those changes to her nutrition status to try to get back to having good, good hormones that will allow their bone density to be optimized. 
And that recovery for bone density, that can take place over much longer. Uh, in particular, we hope to get these athletes you know, before the mid third decade of life when we typically anticipate that people reach their peak bone mass. Uh, we're really doing what we can to maintain bone mass once we get into you know, our, our late 20s and beyond and to try to prevent bone loss that puts us at greater risk for bone injuries in the future. So DEXA scans, again, you know, a big, a big thing I bring up to, to audiences that DEXAs are not just for postmenopausal women. This is the more classic thing is a DEXA scan is offered to a woman after she's reached menopause, after she's had a rapid drop off of estradiol level and bone density is already now much lower than it would have been beforehand. Um, these criteria from Female Athlete Triad Coalition really are, are nice ways to justify getting a DEXA. And if there's a current bone injury that's coming to me in clinic I, and they meet the criteria, I definitely push for the DEXA. I've had athletes come in for other things like patellofemoral pain, but on my questionnaire intake form, I'm like, yeah, I'm actually just concerned about your, your global musculoskeletal health. And one thing we can do to just get a sense for where your bone density currently is and ways that we might help to optimize that is to get a DEXA. So DEXAs are, are definitely something that are relatively inexpensive and safe and can be very helpful uh, clinically. Now, you know, I mean, we're, we're uh, most of us probably reside in, in America where there's a lot of, you know, direct to consumer, uh, you know, uh, pharmaceutical companies. Um, you know, while medication is something we commonly think of for disease states, such as lower bone density, we have to recognize there's not really an easy fix for this. Um, so in particularly female athletes during reproductive age, we, we really want to avoid the medication bisphosphonate because those actually live in the bone for years and they're known to have to, to be a concern for uh, teratogen, meaning that they can cause birth defects. There's a medication that we will uh, sparingly use in female and some male athletes called Forteo. And this is a parathyroid hormone related peptide so we've, we've all been through, you know, the challenges of vaccine manufacturing and safety. This is a very fragile protein that has to remain refrigerated um, and costs roughly $2,000 per year, or uh, sorry, per month, and oftentimes requires six to 12 months of treatment uh, to really be effective for uh, bone gains. Um, there are limited studies showing this may be helpful in certain extreme cases of an athlete with really low bone density um, and is recovering from a bone injury because it's actually an anabolic agent. So it may help with bone remodeling. The, the medication I more commonly think of is in the female athlete who has oligomenorrhea or amenorrhea, meaning they're not having menstrual periods they have lower bone density, maybe they're recovering from a bone injury, they've made modifications to their diet, is really to consider transdermal estrogen with micronized progesterone. So the reason why we think this can be helpful is the estrogen is actually delivered uh, through a patch, and that patch then helps to deliver the estradiol subcutaneously. So that avoids going through the liver where oral contraceptive pills are metabolized and where oral contraceptive pills haven't been shown to be good for bone gains or reducing the risk for bone injury. A lot of this is because of the way the oral contraceptive pills are metabolized and don't result in increasing the overall net levels of uh, physiological estradiol. Um, the important thing to note is that transdermal estrogen with this oral progesterone to ensure uh, monthly bleeds is not um, an effective form of hormonal contraception. It's really to restore physiological levels of estradiol to help promote bone mass. Um, now, one thing I do in my clinic that I mentioned before was shockwave. So shockwave is one thing we will consider in limited cases of stress fractures. The, the nice part about this is this is um, these devices are the size of a 1990s desktop computer. They're on a cart. I do this in my outpatient clinic. And what was found is that the use of shock waves for treating kidney stones actually led to an increase in bone growth around um, the uh, pelvis bone 
in individuals when they first started doing this treatment. So you could destroy a kidney stone, but it appeared that it actually led to bone gains. And that was further studied uh, in the orthopedic literature. And what Shockwave has been shown to do is upregulate nitrous oxide. That helps to increase vascular epithelial growth factors. So increases blood flow to the bone and that may help to accelerate bone remodeling and help to heal fracture. So we sometimes consider this particularly in high level athletes, given the fact that the shockwave is safe, it's non-invasive, it is painful, it's not covered by insurance, but it can lead to a more predictable healing response. And the goal is that it may allow for a more predictable return to, to running. We also need to remember the basics. Physical therapy is critically important. We've got to address the movement impairments. We've got to address the full kinetic chain. It's not everyone has a weak core and you just need to do core exercises. We need to think a little bit more detailed on what are the impairments that lead the athlete to be at risk for this injury. That's what I'm really proud of for all the, the folks that I work with uh, from the PT world at Spalding and uh, in the Mass General Brigham sites. And gait retraining is something we will consider with those with prior bone stress injury. Again, I'm, I'm very rarely recommending at this stage that they would do something like minimalist footwear with forefoot strike running because that places a lot more loads through the foot and ankle. But there are most of the time ways that we can improve gait even without leading to significant increased load to other bones, such as increasing someone's uh, cadence changing their trunk lane or teaching them how to land with better alignment. Return to sport, this really needs to be a very gradual, um, you know, typically alternating days of running with days of, of non-running uh, and the activity and the time between uh, running sessions needs to be pain-free. So this is one, uh, one example from our Nature Reviews Disease Primers uh, illustrating kind of a walk-run progression. And in the meantime, we, we illustrate on the far right, we, we get it, athletes, particularly runners, they wanna keep moving. So things like swimming, things like deep water running, use of elliptical, uh, even an ultra G or, or other anti-gravity treadmill, maybe other ways so we can supplement cross training and help with the goals to build fitness as we allow the skeleton to be ready for um, full running on ground. So when we think about ways to optimize skeletal health, I really encourage just being proactive. So, you know, even, even, you know, for those in the audience, if you're a female athlete and don't have regular menstrual periods or you score at elevated risk using those triad categories, I mean, this is something where it can be helpful to actually try to understand, you know, am I in the low energy availability state or are there other things that need to be corrected that could help to optimize my bone health? And very similar to male athletes, who I think we also um, sometimes are challenged to meet our fueling requirements. Promoting bone loading at early age is really important. Um, I was just coaching my daughter's soccer. Uh, you know, she's just having fun. I mean, she's nine and, you know, she's running up and down the field, sprinting, doing multi-directional loading. I mean, those are the types of activities we should be encouraging. And if she wants to run, uh, you know, more competitively down the road, that'll be great. But, you know, we're setting her up to have, you know, a positive um, look on the sport and to see, you know, multiple ways of loading her musculoskeletal system so that her body will be optimized when she, you know, decides on a specific sport to focus on. Really need to focus on good, um, high quality sleep and ensuring that we're really aggressive with optimizing nutrition early, including just meeting the basic requirements for calcium and vitamin D, where we found, you know, upwards of half, half of runners, even at younger ages, aren't meeting their calcium vitamin D targets. So I'm going to move on to another condition called patellofemoral pain. And this is going to be my model for discussing our, our, our strategies around treatment of uh, joint pain. But patellofemoral pain in particular is considered to be the most common cause of anterior knee pain. And those results from abnormal stress of the patella against the femoral condyle. So causing stress to the patellofemoral joint. There are a number of risk factors. So a lot of athletes I see with this condition, they were like, yeah, I was just told that my quads are weak. 
Yeah, that's that is one one risk uh, in the local impairments, but there are other issues too in terms of the way the relative quadricep muscles contract to allow the patella to be stabilized. There can be issues with soft tissue impairments, such as the IT band or tight calves. Not that I know any runners with tight calves, right? I mean, we all have tight calves or the hamstring muscles and the way that that influences the stress of the patellofemoral joint. There are aspects of biomechanics that we can try to address, including, you know, weakness in the hip abductors, uh, external rotators, uh, excessive foot pronation has been uh, considered a risk. Pes planus, I, again, I look at someone's foot uh, structure and think, you know, a, a planus foot just means it's flat. Why is it flat? I mean, were you born with a flat foot or do you have weakness in your feet that you could improve that might affect the way that you land? And then excessive, uh, excessive impact shock with heel strikes. So how hard do you land? That's also been shown to be a risk factor. And then there's the training errors. We're all guilty of this as runners, but recognizing that if we increase our exercise too quickly, don't give ourselves enough time for recovery or do excessive incline decline work, um, you know, such as squats, um, that's, that's really gonna put a lot of preferential stress on this joint and place uh, individuals at risk for injury. So our goals when we're, when we're treating this are really to focus on pain relief, modifying activity, physical therapy to improve the mechanics in the lower extremity, a gradual return to running. And unless this is truly an osteoarthritis state uh, where there's actually cartilage loss and inflammation in the joint, our, our goal is to try to get the athlete to having no pain, particularly with patellofemoral pain to reduce the risk that it progresses on to arthritis. We think about braces, there are certain injections that are considered but very rarely do these athletes need surgery. Um, a surgery is more likely to make you weaker as opposed to stronger, and it's not necessarily gonna fix all of those biomechanical deficits. So we also need to recognize that for this condition, sometimes we do need to think about gait retraining because you can strengthen these muscles. And this becomes really the frustrating thing for runners that I've seen, they're like, I have patellofemoral pain. I've been told my glutes are weak. I've been told my quads are weak. I've worked on them. I'm pretty strong now. And in fact, they may test relatively strong. And so what we need to think about is, well, are you using that strength functionally to move with good alignment? Or as you fatigue, do you forget how to use those muscle groups? And that's actually what gait retraining can accomplish. Uh, and the concept of like hardware and software, you can have great hardware, you can have glutes that you've like, you know, you could win the clamshell championships of the world, rock solid, but when you're asked to do, when you're asked to repetitively run, which is a series of squats, hops and landings without falling down, over time, the, the leg comes in and that joint gets more and more aggravated. So we really have to think about ways that we can teach runners how to move differently. And that's really what gait retraining comes down to. So the early studies showing this is possible, um, you know, started with my former collaborator, Irene Davis. And this was essentially using a mirror and telling individuals to keep your knees apart. She was able to demonstrate that by gradually increasing the amount of running, and that's illustrated in that upper right panel of total treadmill time in blue. And then after session four, starting to remove the amount of time that the, the mirror was shown to the runner. So essentially putting uh, a curtain or turning the mirror away, you then fade the feedback, which then leads to the goal of, of a transfer phase where the body is actually starting to encode the movement and starting to feel more natural. And this was actually shown in this in this uh, small uh, this small case series to improve knee pain alignment and uh, had durable benefit benefits out to three months. So this has been further substantiated again um, a review that I wrote uh, with Irene Davis on gait retraining for patellofemoral pain. We looked across all the studies and the patellofemoral joint is probably among the best study joints for gait retraining uh, with running. Um, and the protocols that work the best uh, appeared, had this faded feedback design. Um, and overall, it appeared that it required between eight to 18 sessions 
of actual interaction with PTs over two to six weeks. And, and most of the trials that actually saw a new movement strategy uh, attained took place over greater than three hours of total uh, time with the training. And there are different ways this can be done. Uh, you can illustrate in that uh, image from Chung and Davis that uh, an insert that had a small, um, a small pressure gauge on the heel that would make a beep every time the athlete struck the ground with their heel. You could use that to train people to land more on their forefoot, to land softer. Um, other work by Bonacci showed that you can use a metronome. So you essentially have a, a beat that, that you, uh, you hear and you try to strike the ground at the same rate of, of the metronome to increase cadence. And if you combine that then with different types of shoe wear, you can actually teach the, uh, the runner to land softer. So I'm going to move on to the third class of, of uh, injury, which is tendinopathy. And this is really the term that I use to describe um, the spectrum of tendon disease we see in runners and other athletes. So people just get confused. Um, we were told, you know, growing up that, you know, whenever you had an injury, I mean, I had Achilles, Achilles tendon injury when I was young, I was told it was Achilles tendonitis. Now, in fairness, that, that was our knowledge of science in the past, but our knowledge now is that for most cases, by the time they see a doctor and, and runners are very hesitant to see a doctor, they're afraid they're gonna be told don't run. That's very, very, very rarely something I will recommend and extremely rare that I would recommend it over the long term. But we have to recognize that by the time someone comes to see a doctor and they've had tendon pain, it's very rare that they would just have inflammation around their tendon, which is what tendonitis is. Tendinosis is actually the more chronic form of tendon disease that we see. And this is really an injury with disorganized collagen, um, you know, thickening of the tendon, sometimes calcium deposits. And this really represents what we believe to be a failed healing response. The body tried to repair the trauma to the tissue, but put down uh, proteins and other fibers in a way that led to the tendon not being able to be loaded without pain. So this is why we use the term tendinopathy. It's tendon pain, it's stiffness, and it's loss of function associated with the mechanical loading state of, of running or other activity. So there are different risk factors for this. There are intrinsic risk factors of being older. Uh, men appear to be at a greater risk than women. Uh, genetics uh, can play a role in in being predisposed to tendon disease or faulty limb mechanics. Extrinsically, uh, a, an acute change in activity, you know, for example, you know, in track and field, as we get into, you know, wearing our spikes for workouts or races, that that's going to put more stress on the, on the tendon. You can have training factors of increasing the volume. Um, Footwear, as we talked about, uh, particularly when you go to more minimal shoes, it puts more load through the calf and the Achilles complex. Loading characteristics, how hard you land uh, may play a role. And then there are culprit medications. So just a public service announcement to runners, I don't recommend you know, oral steroids when at all possible because they can be, um, they can challenge the tendon by suppressing inflammation. But the particular drug that I, I really hope runners can avoid is something called fluoroquinolones. Um, and those are medications that are sometimes given for urinary tract infections or respiratory infections, or even before um, a urological procedures. But those medications have actually been, they have a black box warning, they can cause tendon rupture, but our sports science community is now appreciating that the, the use of these medications may lead to more longer term structural issues with tendon. So, um, you know, if you're a runner that particularly has had a history of tendon injury, I really recommend avoiding those medications unless it's a risk to life or limb. So it's always just a good takeaway. If you're, if you're a runner, if you can avoid those medications, you just tell the doctor, I'm a runner. Is this one associated with tendon injury? I'd like to try a different one if possible. Uh, that's best practice. So when we manage tendinopathy, we really need to think about modifying the activity uh, for you know, Achilles tendinopathy, that might be a heel lift, it might be taping, heat or ice, whatever feels good, I think is fine. 
Anti-inflammatories are a little controversial because again, we think inflammation is part of how the body repairs itself. So I'm not typically recommending those. We need to get the individual though into PT to really work on biomechanical and strength deficits contributing to the injury. And then there are other uh, interventions such as shockwave or other um, uh, injection-based treatments such as uh, using blood products, uh, platelet-rich plasma, or something called tenotomy that can help with tendon healing. Very rarely do tendon injuries, particularly chronic injuries where the tendon is not fully torn, require surgery. We've also looked at specific injuries. Um, as I shared earlier, I've, I've had Achilles tendon pain on and off for 25 years. So this has really been something that I've been searching for the kryptonite. I've, I've just wanted to, to find the way to treat this injury and to prevent individuals from having this injury. So what we did is we actually got it. We, we wrote a review article where we looked across all the studies for ways to manage um, mid-portion Achilles tendinopathy and tried to answer the question, does physical therapy work or are there other conditions that may work in combination with physical therapy to get people better. So in the short term, physical therapy does in fact work. Uh, the Alfredson protocol of doing three sets of 15 repetitions, both with the knee bent and straight twice a day uh, has been shown to be quite effective for the treatment of Achilles tendon disease. And it's thought that particularly lowering, uh, lowering that heel, so loading the tendon uh, while, while stretching it May, may lead to an increase in collagen deposition and repairing the tendon along with disrupting uh, pain signals. Um, in, in those with more insertional Achilles tendon pain, those lower images uh, below the step re represent the modified Alfredson protocol. And that's what I recommend when someone has more pain at the base of their heel from insertional Achilles tendon pain. Um, so when we looked at how these eccentric exercises play out in the literature, we do find that in the short term, the eccentric exercises don't on average lead to better improvements. And that's very frustrating, but also reflects what I see with a lot of runners where they've been doing PT for a few months, they're not feeling better yet. So, you know, re requires some encouragement to stay the course and to at least get those three months to ensure that you have appropriate loading, because now we believe tendons remodel over probably six to 12 months. So doing these loading exercises for a long period of time is going to be important. In the shorter term, though, the use of a high volume injection with corticosteroid around the tendon, along with doing the heel drops, did seem to have a, a better effect than just doing the heel drops alone. And then there was one study that showed a really strong effect of acupuncture. Again, this wasn't specific to runners. So I, I kind of interpret this with some caution. Over the longer term, so these were studies with outcomes at three months to a year, we find that the recommendation to just see how it goes, uh, the wait and see approach actually does worse than anything. So um, eccentric exercises are definitely recommended for the longer term. But those, the strongest effects actually seem to be when you take um, the eccentric exercises, the heel drops, and you combine it with shockwave. Um, and acupuncture, again, from that one study, really strong effect, but combined shockwave with eccentric seems to be particularly helpful for Achilles tendon pain. So we've looked at this in my clinic, um, how Achilles tendinopathy can be treated really effectively with shockwave. In general, we think that people with Achilles tendon pain that's right at the base of the heel doesn't do as well as those that have it kind of more in the medial part of the Achilles. And those with something called a Haglund's deformity, which is kind of an outgrowth of bone, those tend to do less well than those with, uh, without. Um, so we also have to recognize that shockwave in, in clinical practice, there are two studies, again, two randomized control studies that actually showed that um, tendon rupture was possible with shockwave. These were two women over 60 years of age. Uh, we don't know what the, what the health of those tendons were before, um, before receiving shockwave. Were they hanging on by a thread? Were they close to 
you know, being a risk for rupturing, but that is one modification we may make if we, if, if, if a patient sees me for shockwave and is older, starting with a, a less aggressive form of radial pressure wave, there aren't, there aren't uh, studies showing that to be a, a risk for a tendon injury. So the things I like about shockwave, again, it's non-invasive, it stays outside of the body. The side effect profile is really just, it, it causes pain during the treatment. It can cause a subset of people to have increased pain uh, because it does stir up inflammation. And we think that's part of how it helps with tendon healing. And in a lot of cases, we allow the athlete to maintain uh, physical activity, running included during the treatment. So I've looked at my outcomes. I think it's really important if you're doing a procedure, particularly one with an out-of-pocket cost, you understand how good you are at what you do. So in a population of 87 uh, patients with Achilles tendon pain, including 63 runners, we looked at an outcome scale called the visa A, which is specific for Achilles tendon function. And we, we compared how well we did with the use of radial pressure waves, which I described as a jackhammer, or combining the radial pressure waves with focused shockwave treatment, combined of course with physical therapy exercises. What we found is that we had an 89.7% success rate when we combined the high energy with the lower energy radial shockwave, compared to almost 64% success when we used radial shockwave treatment. The other interesting part of this was in my clinic, I, I charge a flat rate for the shockwave. And before I had a sense for where the ceiling effect was, I, I would allow athletes to continue to get treated until we kind of both came to the conclusion that we either were where we needed to be in terms of treatment success, or we weren't seeing further relief. So um, there were some that were receiving the radial shockwave, had the opportunity to receive the high energy focus shockwave with the radial shockwave, and of those five that chose to do that, all five actually ultimately reached treatment success. So I do think that shockwave, not all shockwaves created equal and particularly using the higher energy in some cases may lead to a more predictable response. Now, another thing that becomes a real challenge is understanding how active can you be while you have an injury? And this actually comes from the Achilles tendon literature we need to think about how much activity, particularly with the Achilles tendon, is guided by keeping pain ideally in the zero to two range, so the green zone or the safe zone of loading. Pain that's in the two to five range that's considered acceptable or the yellow zone, but we really try to avoid at all stages of healing from a tendon injury pain that's at five or greater out of 10. Um, the concern is that pain that's reaching those levels during or after activity may be a sign that the tendon is taking on excessive load and may be getting re-injured. So we can use this, this, this guide in terms of amount of pain to help athletes to understand how safe it is to participate in her or his sport and hopefully to, you know, in some cases, run with some uh, tendon pain safely. So when when should you see someone like me well i look at this as if you have an injury that's chronic and hasn't responded to treatment if you've had a history of multiple overuse running related injuries feel like you've already done the conventional treatment uh, or you know for athletes that have been told that oh it's normal not to have a menstrual period it just means you're training hard like those are times where seeing a sports medicine provider that has a background in, in these topics can be particularly helpful. Because again, I, I take every athlete who sees me, subtract their age from 100, and I say, well, that's probably how long you want to be running. I mean, we're, you know, almost everyone, I, I'm sure, you know, would love to run their entire life. And, uh, and I really think that that is in a lot of cases possible. So I want to help facilitate that. So um, the summary from this first part of my talk, again, is to say that running injuries are extremely common. We really need effective management that includes a comprehensive approach to reduce the risk that those injuries will recur. And that includes addressing biomechanics, biology, and other risk factors that help to optimize management and prevention. We have to treat the full kinetic chain. So that means not just saying, oh, you have a foot injury. I'm just going to give you a couple ankle exercises. We need to think about what's going on with the glutes. How's the knee tracking? 
Gait retraining can be helpful in some cases to get soft, well-aligned landings. And we really should think about prevention, which is really focused around lifestyle factors, sleeping well, eating well, in females having normal menstrual function and encouraging athletes to be active in sport early, not just in the sport of long distance running, but particularly in sports like basketball and soccer. So I'm gonna move on to the second part of my talk and this is considerations in units runners. Now, what I'm gonna go into briefly is first, how do we understand physical activities, role in bone and musculoskeletal health? And then how do we use this information to, to promote optimal health in youth runners? So we feel really strongly on this topic and the we is the, the experts that, that joined me in writing this consensus statement, which we actually were able to get open access, which means that uh, anyone on, on, this, on this webinar uh, can, can essentially go to the British Journal of Sports Medicine and download this article for free has a lot of charts, a lot of useful things such as, hey, here's a nutrition plan for a typical female or male runner. What, what would it look like? What would their caloric needs be? And oftentimes this can be very helpful to kind of put into context when a youth runner has an injury or is questioning how much they should be active. Can they run a marathon safely at a given age? We tried to tackle all these issues the best we could, um, illustrating the fact there is a lot of a lot of good science and at the same time there are areas that we want ourselves and others to continue to answer so we can keep runners healthy especially if they participate at younger ages so uh, we know that youth running is extremely popular uh, the growth in cross-country track and field and the you know in the young younger ages is really growing it's it's one of the most popular sports in in high school uh, but with higher participation we see a higher rate of running related injuries and the concern, of course, is that these are, these are growing uh, little people, and we want to create opportunities for them to reach their full growth and development um, frame for both physical and psychological health that will allow them to have healthy attitudes around running and exercise in general throughout life. So when we think about sports in youth, we really need to understand two concepts. The first is Wolf's Law which describes how bone adapts to mechanical loading. So an astronaut goes to space, they come back from space, they have not been seeing gravitational forces, they globally have osteoporosis and they really need to very gradually have weight bearing reintroduced to allow their bones to be strong enough so that they don't fracture. In younger, in, in, in the younger runner, we're really thinking more about this primary role of the muscle bone unit theory. So what that describes is outside of trauma, the, the muscle that's trans, the muscle force is transmitted directly or indirectly to bone may lead to the greatest gains in bone strength. In fact, we believe that participation in weight bearing sports such as running may actually lead to greater bone mass compared to those who don't participate in sport. We also believe that around the time of puberty, so that's around the ages of 13 or 11 to 13 in, in girls and 13 to 15 in boys may represent this, this critical window of opportunity to do high impact sports. And in fact, 26% of final bone mass, so the same amount of bone mass we lose throughout adulthood, we actually gain in this two, uh, two year window around the time of puberty. So the question comes down to what sports do you do at those young ages? And we actually, uh, tackled this with a review, which we actually did over a decade ago. And this was looking at sports participation in, uh, you know, from ages 10 to 30 and comparisons between groups in terms of bone strength and bone density. We, we tried to classify sports based on the types of um, impact forces. So high impact was gymnastics, martial arts, volleyball, Multi-directional sports were soccer, basketball, racket games, activities that involve a lot of jumping and cutting. Repetitive lower impact was long distance running. And finally, non-impact was swimming and cycling. What we found is that those athletes who did high impact, multi-directional impact loading sports had the highest bone mass across, across all athlete populations. In particular, it was specific to the bones loaded. 
So if you're uh, a racket sport athlete, not surprisingly, your, your dominant racket arm may have up to 10% higher bone mass than your non-dominant arm. Your body is responding to those loads and is making the bone stronger, so it's less likely to get injured down the road. When we look at the sport of long distance running in contrast, we find that it leads to more modest gains in bone density and bone strength over non-impact sports or those that don't do a sport at all. But these results are inconsistent. And probably a lot of that revolves around the behaviors associated with the sport. Are these athletes in a low energy availability state or are they doing the sport of running and they're optimizing their nutrition, sleep and other components that might allow their bones to get stronger from that sport. So we also have to think about these athletes and their nutrition and youth runners, I, I think are at risk for low energy availability. Um, and at the same time, this is, this is really when these, these athletes are developing attitudes around eating, you know, and, and, you know, what, what food is good or bad. I mean, I think the bigger, the bigger issue is thinking about food as energy. You know, so encouraging these young runners not to think about a good food or a bad food, a good fat or a bad fat, but just to say, wow, that's a that's a really good source of energy or that's a high source of energy. And also to recognize a lot of these athletes, uh, it's been estimated up to half are not meeting their calcium intake, their, you know, their uh, vitamin D intake uh, needs, even just for normal growth and development. So they may be at greater risk for this this low energy availability state. We've actually looked at male youth runners. This has been an area of, of interest for me and found that there are four risk factors for low bone density. And this is in athletes 13 to 19 years of age. So those runners uh, doing greater than 30 miles per week volume, those with a history of stress fracture, those that are less than 85% of their expected body weight or consume fewer than one serving of daily calcium, those are each risk factors for lower bone density and they are cumulative. So meaning that, you know, the, the, the male high school age runner who's running excessive volume has prior stress fracture, poor calcium intake, and has this, this lower body weight for their expected frame, they're at a very high risk for having low bone mass. And of course we want to identify that and correct it because they could potentially correct their bone mass with the right behavioral strategies. Um, we've also looked at high school runners and actually found you know, a large uh, proportion of both girls and boys. This was a, a high school study that uh, I did during um, my uh, medical school and residency training. Um, there's, a high, there's a high proportion that have low bone mineral density Z scores. And we found that in girls, those with a BMI of 17.5 or lower, or those with a history of fracture and menstrual dysfunction were more likely to have low bone density. Whereas in boys, that cutoff of 17.5 for a BMI and, and saying they, they believe that being thinner leads to faster running performances, those were actually each risk factors for having low bone mass. We also need to recognize that bone injuries are just the tip of the iceberg. Um, the work that I did in these high school runners, 748 athletes from 28 high schools in the San Francisco Bay Area, we were finding that over half had already had a prior running related injury, 68% of girls and 59% of boys. We've also looked at middle school runners, and I'm so grateful for the participation of, of individuals in, in the greater Boston area and New England trying to understand the prevalence of running related injuries in these uh, young runners. And we were actually finding that over half have had one or more running related injury by average age 13. Does this reflect behaviors? Does this reflect kind of an earlier focus on, on running as a primary sport? Uh, we, we, we can't tell from these data, but it does suggest that these running injuries are happening and you know, we should be concerned about the fact that young runners are getting these injuries and try to identify ways to prevent them in the future. We found that in these uh, middle school age runners, these dietary factors of skipping meals, missing breakfast, or consuming less milk were risk factors actually for across running related injuries. 
as well as having a greater training volume or being a faster runner. Again, if you're a faster runner, you might be more serious about the sport, but you may also be doing a lot more running and may not be doing the variety of sports that allow you to develop in other domains. We also found specific to female runners, a higher dietary restraint score, a later age of reaching menarche, current menstrual disturbances, eating disorder diagnosis, which in, I, I was shocked. It was something like 3% of this cohort had a history of an eating disorder. So, I mean, when you, when you think about what we should be prepared for when we take care of youth runners or, or at one of these like mass participation events, you know, an, an athlete that's towing the line who may have an untreated eating disorder, we really need to be prepared to provide care for, for her, or for him. Um, and following a vegetarian diet, these were all risk factors for overuse injury. We also, again, those bone stress injuries that we talked about earlier, a, a higher rate in girls and boys. And we were actually finding injuries that I would have thought of to be relatively unheard of in a 13 year old. Were, were occurring in these young athletes. So 16 girl runners and of those um, sustaining stress fractures in the pelvis, in the sacrum, in the femoral neck, and, and one boy runner sustained an injury in, in, in these regions. So again, injuries that we oftentimes look at as a marker for low bone density that are happening at very young ages. In, in girl runners, the risk factors included consuming fewer than three meals a day, uh, history of an eating disorder, family history of osteoporosis, which really points to a genetic predisposition, as well as being of older age. Uh, in, in males, it was actually prior fracture, family history of osteoporosis, and running a greater volume that was a risk factor for boy runners. Another interesting factor, though, is we actually looked at other sports participation. Again, the, these are 13-year-olds. So those that were currently or had recently participated in the sports of basketball and soccer had a lower risk for sustaining a running related injury or a stress fracture. And it appeared to be a 60 to 80% reduction, particularly in bone stress injuries. And this really argues for the fact that, you know, again, we can't totally characterize the behaviors. Maybe, maybe those athletes that are more serious are more likely to get a bone injury or more likely to run faster or more likely to be um, running a greater volume. But this also may make an argument that we should not be encouraging these athletes to do early sports specialization. We should encourage these athletes to continue to be active in sports. Yes, even outside of running um, and do you know, if someone wants to take a break and not do indoor track, uh, particularly if there's a family history of low bone density and they're really focused on like, I want to be great in college. I want to be able to run lifelong. I've seen other people with injuries. It's okay to take a season off. It's okay to do basketball. It's okay to do something completely different from uh, long distance running uh, between the cross country and the outdoor track and field season. So my recommendations on injury prevention in the youth runners really is promoting sports sampling discouraging early sports specialization and running, really taking these uh, pre-participation physical examinations seriously. I mean, kids are running their pediatrician, just sign this. But I mean, there, there are questions on there that are really helpful. And sometimes you find athletes that make it to um, college age and, and they've just been passed off without ever having a menstrual period and they're 18. I mean, that should have been flagged. That's what a PPE is supposed to do. It's supposed to help to screen for health concerns that may interfere with safe participation in sport. It doesn't mean you disqualify the athlete, but you actually actively treat that while that athlete does some level of sport and you make sure that it's safe. And we really should focus on optimizing sleep quality. I think Athletes are overscheduled. They need free play. They need to, you know, they need to be uh, doing, you know, sports that are directed uh, with with protection from their parents and guardians. And we really should think about ball sports, jumping activities at young ages. I'm I'm a big proponent for basketball, soccer. You know, um, these are just activities where it's not like, hey, go jump on a box a hundred times. I mean, there have been studies showing that can be effective for bone, bone, bone growth, but 
my daughter wants to do Irish step. And I think that's great. Her feet are going to be stronger. She's going to be like jumping all over the place. She's going to be more coordinated than I ever was as a runner. So those are all really good things to encourage at a young age. So in summary, uh, when we think about the youth runner, musculoskeletal development combined with optimal energy intake, calcium and vitamin D may be the best strategies for promoting lifelong health and reducing the risk for future overuse injury. So with that, I really thank you for your attention. I know this is, this is a relatively late time uh, in the day, but it's, it's just wonderful getting to you know, share my enthusiasm for taking care of runners. Um, this is my email. I, I always get at least one email after one of these talks, people reaching out, wanting to see me uh, as a patient or, you know, recommend someone see me. Um, these are ways to kind of get a hold of me from email and from Twitter. I try to post my, you know, my more recent research work and findings so that people can stay up to date on the current science. So with that, I, I thank you all. And we uh, deliberately ended this a little earlier to allow for some question answer. All right. Yeah. Thank you uh, for that incredibly informative talk. And I think I'm speaking for everyone when I say that I learned a lot. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat box or raise your little hand on Zoom. Um, we did have some questions submitted ahead of time, um, which I would be happy uh, to read and we would uh, love to hear your thoughts on those. Yeah. Let's go for it. All right. So our first question is just in general, um, advice on how to prevent foot injuries. Yeah, it's a, it's a hot topic. And I mean, what I would say from, from my time having worked with Irene Davis, she was very well known for the concepts of minimalist footwear, uh, strengthening people's feet. I mean, there's certainly some merit to that, even if you're not going to do a minimalist footwear, a four foot strike running. So I think, you know, the strategies around this, and again, this is assuming you don't have some kind of sensory deficit, like a neuropathy, um, is being barefoot. I mean, my, my kids, my family, I mean, most cultures encourage being barefoot at home. And I mean, that's more for hygiene, but when you're barefoot, you're actually going to use your feet in ways that improves coordination, proprioception, and gets your feet stronger. I don't think it's a problem to wear flip-flops as long as as long as it's a safe environment. Um, you know, shoes that don't have a lot of cushioning, um, again, are going to challenge your feet. And there have been some studies comparing using minimal shoes, so shoes that really have a very very low stack height, don't have any kind of a midsole, have just an upper that kind of keeps the sole of the shoe on the bottom of the foot and protects the foot from cuts and scrapes that can have very similar gains in strength as you would gain from doing a structured physical therapy program focused around foot core. So in my kids, I, I keep them in minimal shoes. And, and the reason for that is they don't know anything different. You know, they were, you know, you're, you're born barefoot and you're going to develop strength or you're going to lose that strength and dexterity if you go into more traditional shoes. And at the same time, that doesn't mean that I don't want them wearing shoes. I mean, they wear shoes in the community. I think that's just socially accepted and it's it protects your feet. Um, so I think those are the best ways to strengthen the feet. And I think people with foot injuries, sometimes they're, they see a doctor and all they get are some, you know, uh, ankle ABCs and balancing. They're, the, the PT exercises for foot strengthening have come a long way. Um, and I also think it's not just a strong foot, it's also a, a flexible foot. I mean, the feet have 26 bones, 32 joints, four layers of muscles. And if, if the joint has been injured, such as an ankle sprain, but the, the mobility of the hind foot isn't restored, the foot can still, even if the foot's as strong as it was before, it still may move in an abnormal way, contributing to foot pain. So I, again, I, I really get excited about taking care of feet. There's some doctors don't want to touch feet. And I'm like, that's okay. And I'm not a surgeon. I don't like injecting people. So my approach is really like thinking about the foot the same way I would think about treating someone with back pain or hip pain or knee pain. I don't, 
I don't prescribe to everyone suddenly has feet that need to, you know, be posted and corrected and you can never, never be barefoot again. I think those extremes are not helpful. And I think the other extreme is telling everyone just be barefoot all the time. I mean, your feet need time to adapt. Some people don't respond well to that. So it's just figuring out ways to support your, your individualized foot strength. All right, thank you so much uh, for that answer. Um, our next question uh, goes more into joint injuries. Um, since a meniscus does not heal, does it cause more damage to run through it and will, or will it eventually get better? Uh, so does running cause knee arthritis? <laughs> and in particular after a meniscus tear. So, you know, the short of it is we don't know. Um, what we do know though, is that running as a whole is not dangerous for joint health. We actually think that joints similar as bones and muscles need load to remain strong. And if people don't load their joints because they're not physically active, that may actually contribute to cartilage loss and arthritis. The, the nuances of meniscus tears is probably beyond the, the topic. The big, the big things that I look at if someone's had a meniscus tear is, you know, do they have a tear that's, that's recent or is this a chronic tear? And then do you have current symptoms? So if your knee is locking, your knee is swelling, I mean, you really need to see a doctor and, and make sure that the level of activity and your goals are in, in line with taking a non-surgical approach. Um, but, but the goals are that if someone has, you know, wear and tear changes of their meniscus, which we oftentimes get similar to wrinkles as we age, if you're not actually having active pain from the meniscus tear or swelling from the meniscus tear, um, if you optimize the strength of your knees and the way you move, you may actually prevent that meniscus tear from causing further joint stress down the road. So, you know, the, the, the challenge with it is it's a nuanced answer. It depends, but um, it's not also a game over answer. If someone has something seen on imaging that that means you're never going to be able to do the sport of running again. All right. Yeah. Thank you for that very detailed answer. Um, our next question uh, is would like to uh, would like to hear your suggestions for learning um, how to fall in ways to prevent fractures while running. Um, so I don't know um, I think sort of thing, kind of ways to move um, I guess movement patterns to prevent fractures while running. Yeah, um, it's challenging. I mean, they actually say, you know, with, with older age, you know, falls are one of the leading causes of fracture. So I think it's beyond the, the, the talk here to say like the correct way to fall and the incorrect way to fall. Um, I think the bigger things for preventing falls though is, is really just common sense. I mean, running, running at dusk without, you know, in, in black clothing without any, without any light on uneven surfaces with headphones. I mean, you're just asking for trouble. Um, so we just have to be safe when we enjoy our sport. And I mean, there are concerns about safety for both men and women, but in particular, I, 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 I get very concerned about women that are distracted in their environment and maybe in areas where there are not a lot of people around. And I think those are the bigger times where I get worried about you know, falls or other forms of trauma and about just, you know, doing things for, for safety. So a lot of it, as I look at, is just common sense and, and avoiding, you know, a distracted driver from hitting you with a car when you're running or being somewhere where someone, you know, may, you know, worst case assault you. Uh, we should be able to enjoy our sport and we should feel safe in our community. But Part of that is making sure that we're doing things to keep ourselves safe and, and you know, running with others. Uh, you know, those are all good strategies too. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and another question is, you know, we, you talked a lot about some of the challenges um, with low energy availability and other risk, risk factors for bone stress injuries. Um, then there's also this benefit of loading, whether it be from a formal resistance training program or from another sport or simply 
play if it's a, um, a very young athlete, but is there any research on the extent to which these um, kind of bone strengthening or bone loading modalities can negate some of these other risk factors for bone stress injuries? Yeah, so, you know, the, the, str the strongest evidence we have for preventing a bone injury is, is probably actually that early childhood youth time of uh, doing basketball, soccer. And that's why I love giving that talk. And, and sometimes I am my talk with like a picture of my daughter when she was three and she had like her sippy cup of milk and it was her first soccer practice. And, and she was a great sleeper. It's like, those are all the key ingredients. Um, we don't have a lot of great ways to prevent bone injuries. I mean, our sport, unfortunately, has one of the highest rates of these injuries. And so I think a lot of it is just about like, you know, an ounce of prevention is worth a, th a pound of cure. You know, it's really, you know, sometimes athletes aren't even thinking about how much they need to eat, how much, you know, or even like, oh, yeah, I guess I don't drink a lot of milk anymore. Oh, let me look at my diet. Yeah, I actually don't get that much calcium in. And then you can take some proactive ways to try to prevent those injuries. And I mean, Look, I mean, there are a lot of runners like me. We're type A, you know, we're like trying to make things happen 24 hours a day. These are not the times where you, you know, if you got a ton of like crazy work and deadlines and, and, and life stressors, you know, you have to figure out, do I train for a marathon or do I train for a 5k or am I okay training for a marathon and maybe not putting in the long runs I want because I need to catch up on sleep on the weekend. I mean, those are the trade-offs. It's a much more nuanced answer. It's hard to give any absolutes. And, and I think that's the unfortunate thing too about a lot of these things with running injuries is we're, we're looking for the cure. You know, it's like, oh, this shoe or this book and, you know, we, we, we figured it out. No, no one's figured it out. I mean, what I'm, what I'm presenting is practical guidance based on the best evidence. And I hope that evidence will get even better as we go. Hey, great, thank you. Um, we do have a new question in the chat. Um, we also have a common, excellent presentation, Adam, thank you. Oh, shucks. Um, and then the question is, what are recommended doses of calcium and vitamin D supplements for 10 year old runners? Yeah, so I believe for nine to 18 years of age, the, the Institute of Medicine recommends 1300 milligrams of calcium and 600 international units of vitamin D. So what I, what I tell athletes is that should mean that you're having like one to two servings of, of dairy. So milk, cheeses, yogurt per meal, three meals a day. Um, and again, chocolate milk's been, you know, I mean, it's amazing. We had to do sports science to show that that was a good recovery drink. I mean, my, my favorite chocolate milk is a mocha after I've had a, a long workout, you know, <laughs> but you know, that's that it, yeah, it's, it's food. And, and that's really where we target that the vitamin D. Um, and that relates to another question here about, do we recommend, do I recommend a vitamin D supplement in young athletes, especially in Northeast Midwest? No, I recommend a vitamin D supplement to all runners, particularly in the Northeast Midwest. We are all relatively vitamin D insufficient, uh, older age, darker pigmented skin, um, body mass, um, anyone who has a history of diabetes, these are all risk factors for having low vitamin D status. And then we're further away from the equator. Uh, we should be using sun protection. Uh, we should not be just burning ourselves to a crisp with the, the false belief we're going to reach our endogenous vitamin D levels. That just does not play out in the science, nor is that what the instrument, the uh, recommended daily intake of vitamin D based on. It's not based on sun exposure or 600 international units. It's 600 international units. And that's up from 200 from, you know, a couple of decades ago, we're probably going to learn the number needs to be higher. And that's for the general population. It's not for runners. So we have to think about all this, you know, your vitamin D, I think for a runner should be at least in the sufficient level, which is in the thirties. You go too okay. high and you take a huge supplement dose, like a million units, there's a risk for hip fracture. Um, you can also though, you know, not, not take enough or, or, or in the extremes of taking too much, you can also lead to ex excessive calcium, uh, deposition, and it could be a risk factor for heart disease. But the bigger thing is we should be able to find the middle line, which is, you know, numbers at least above 30 and with 
a history of bone stress injury, we're oftentimes thinking 45 to 50 might be a better target. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, two more questions popping up in, sorry, three more questions popping up in the chat. Um, I do want to be um, as mindful as possible of your time. Um, but we're good, I, I'll stay okay. as long as people want. <laughs> All right, thank you for that. Um, so the first question is, we talked a lot about the menstrual cycle being important. What is your advice for a female who started oral contraceptives a few years ago and from the start never got her period? Mm. It, I mean, again, that's it's a more nuanced discussion. I mean, there's a number of reasons why a young woman might go on or, oral contraceptive pills. It might be for might be for hormones, it might be for menorrhagia, it, you know, it could be for a number of reasons. Um, so first off, it would come down to why did the female athlete start on oral contraceptive pills? It may have been a recommendation from a well-intentioned physician that, oh, your daughter hasn't had her period and she should have had one by 15 or 16. Let's try to kickstart it with oral contraceptive pills. We understand right now that that's not the best science, nor is it the best guidance. So the challenge comes down to if someone's on an oral contraceptive pill and they're having what we call withdrawal bleeding from the sugar pills, does that mean that in the background, their body is, is seeing those normal cycles of estradiol and progesterone that are allowing the bones to get stronger? I think the ways to look at it is if that athlete never had a menstrual period and there's concerns about bone mass, does it make sense to get a DEXA scan? Because that at least could give you a sense where is that athlete during the time of growth and development? And even if an athlete is on oral contraceptive pills, um, you know, for various reasons, you could still meet with a dietitian to make sure that this isn't, this isn't um, you know, a sign that the athlete is still in a low energy availability status. So we have a lot of, you know, college athletes, older athletes. I mean, they're on oral contraceptive pills for very good reasons. And the recommendation isn't necessarily to stop them. I mean, but there are other forms of hormonal contraception that don't involve the pill, which could allow for seeing uh, withdrawal bleeding. Um, so there are a lot of different ways to approach this issue. Okay, thank you uh, for that advice. Um... And the next question is similar. Um, if a young teenage female runner has low bone mineral density identified, but then is able to correct it to a normal level, are there any long-term issues related to this episode of low bone density? So it's a great question. Um, the answer is probably not. A bone density is not a is not a great is not a great proxy for bone strength, but it's really the way that we describe if an athlete meets the criteria for having low bone mass. So, I mean, this would be what I would consider a success story. The female athlete who is under fueling is identified to have suboptimal bone mass. Maybe they're a little delayed in terms of their growth, and then they rapidly correct their nutrition. They have spontaneous resumption in normal menstrual cycles, and then their bone density returns into the normal range. Again, I mean, that athlete, I think, is on a really good trajectory. I think the other challenge, of course, is if there were behaviors related to the low bone density at younger ages, we have to recognize, especially during the pandemic, I mean, there are athletes that are dealing with serious mental health issues. And it, it's always possible to have a relapse. So an athlete that has disordered eating, I mean, I've taken care of some of those athletes and, and they have another episode of disordered eating because of the stress of the pandemic. So it's also, you know, like, look, you're doing great, stay the course, good data, really encourage, really good encouragement, but then also trying to create the right social network so that that athlete doesn't, you know, necessarily end up on a hyper competitive team where people are competing on how little they can eat, or they don't have support from their coaches or body shaming. There's so many messed up things about our sport that we just have to correct. And a lot of it is the culture. And I think the culture is changing for the positive, but there's still some people that are a little behind the eight ball. Okay, thank you. Um, so our next question is, is on a little bit different of a topic. Um, how does running surface factor into bone stress injuries? For example, running on trails slash track versus sidewalk slash asphalts. Yeah, I mean, 
so my my answer on this has evolved. I mean, the way that I was taught to think about this in high school is you take a golf ball and you know you bounce it on a sidewalk. I mean, it's gonna bounce all the way back. So like imagine that's your foot striking the ground, that force is gonna go straight up. Um, and then if you are on a track, uh, you're on a trail and it's really soft and undulating, you're on grass and drop the golf ball and just goes boom. Well, that's part of the equation. So, I mean, ideally you run on softer, uh, softer surfaces. I think it, you know, sometimes it just feels better. I think it adds greater variability because again, it, the surfaces are a little less predictable. So the, the body then isn't seeing the same forces repetitively. A lot of it comes down though, what are you training for? If you're training for cross country, you can't be running on roads and on tracks for all your workouts because you're not gonna be used to those uneven surfaces and you're not gonna be have the specific adaptations that will allow you to be effective in your sport. I think the bigger issue is that acute changes. So, you know, you, you go from high school where you had trails to run on and you did some workouts on a track and now suddenly you're in a more urban setting and all of your runs in college, now you've increased your volume and you're just running on sidewalks and, and asphalt. Well, your body needs some time to adapt to that. Um, but even how stiff you'll land will vary based on how hard the surface is. So I look at this as variety is good. Um, any change needs to be done gradually. And sometimes the reality is someone goes to a college where they're just around a bunch of sidewalks. So you start to think like, do I increase the volume and add this new surface? Or do I, you know, think about creative ways to cross train? Uh, or do I find, you know, boring grass fields? I would do that during college. I was like, this is the easy run. I just need to run on some soft surfaces. And, and then you, you don't worry about it. Uh, training surfaces have not been shown to be a good risk factor for bone injury is what it comes down to. And it's because of all those different variables, your body will become more compliant or stiffer depending on the surface. And the same thing happens with footwear. So just try not to change too many variables at one time. All right, thank you. Um, so our last question right now in the chat um, is I've had chronic pain in my foot that was very localized has lasted a couple months and is improving. Um, X-rays and MRIs came back normal. Is this a soft tissue injury, tendonitis? Will physical therapy help? Yeah, I mean, I, I think this, I've, I've certainly had these cases come to see me. Um, and, you know, the good news is first off, there are a lot of runners, they come in, they have foot pain, they may get an X-ray and then they're told they're fine. So, I've seen that scenario play out where someone has an x-ray and, and they keep pushing and then finally someone gets them an MRI and they have like a full-blown stress fracture. So we recognize that x-rays can be negative, you know, up to 85% of the time in the first two to three weeks on presentation of pain. So if that came back normal, the MRI comes back normal, we have to recognize the MRI is the gold standard for looking for a bone stress injury. So assuming that was read correctly, what you're probably dealing with is at least no radiographic findings of a more severe injury. That doesn't mean though, that there couldn't be some impairments in the joint movement. It doesn't mean there couldn't be a tendon injury that's not showing up as inflammation or a more advanced like tendon wear and tear change that you see on MRI. And so that's, that's definitely a case where seeing, you know, if, if it's, if it's a challenge for the PT to figure out what's wrong with the foot, to see a provider that can kind of look at the foot and ankle, look at the joints, try to figure out where the pain is. I mean, the, the history and the physical exam is kind of a lost art. I mean, MRIs and, and x-rays are great uh, to, to rule out, you know, the more sinister pathology, but at the end of the day, you want to have a targeted intervention uh, and treatment plan. And physical therapy, I view as the mainstay. So in short, long-winded question to say, yes, PT would be good. And if it continues to be a problem, you know, seeing a doctor who, you know, can do a more detailed exam may help to kind of point to where the pain's coming from. Okay, terrific. Uh, thank you again for that information. Um, are there any other audience questions uh, right now? Uh, so I'm not seeing anything in the chat. I'm not seeing any of the little Zoom raised hands. Um, so thank you uh, so much. Uh, 
Dr. Tenforti, for your time and for sharing uh, your experience and research and knowledge with all of us. Um, and I know all of these ideas are going to help um, the attendees, but also a lot of people we know and work with um, to enjoy our sport in as healthy a way as possible. Um, and already I'm seeing some uh, thank you messages in the chats. Um, and then if there are any other questions, um, you have Dr. Ken Forty's email address. And then I'll also be posting the recording on the uh, Perform 24 site as well. Well, thank you again for the for the invitation, for the enthusiasm from everyone here. I, I know that people usually have better places to be at, at 9 p.m. Eastern time, uh, but I I love our sport um, and absolutely honored to be able to to share what I know and uh, hope it's helpful for for you and others, you know.